Hello, we'd like to know what's going on in the immigration world. Well, today, this video is for you. I'll be sharing some of the insights I gathered from the American Immigration Lawyers Association conference um, just a few weeks ago. And I'll be talking about some updates about immigration court, asylum law, and some you know, um, policies regarding um, travel inside and outside the United States based on the pandemic. My name is Jorge Molina. I am an immigration attorney based in Dallas-Fort Worth, but serving clients around the world. And I was fortunate enough to be at the American Immigration Lawyers Association um, National Conference um, just a, about 10 days ago in New York City. And it was remarkable because um, we had some very good information here. And it was nice to see how different chapters, different practices um, around the country were, were experiencing and interacting with the government. So our bread and butter, what, what we really enjoy doing is removal defense, you know, uh, defending people from deportation. So I have some updates here. So um, what I consider to be the most interesting thing is that in certain jurisdictions, cocaine is no longer cocaine. So, um, and let me explain that. So for example, if you, uh, if the government is charging you for with possession of cocaine and therefore you're um, deportable. The government must show that you were convicted for a for a violation a, of the Controlled Substance Act, and and the underlying conviction is a match with the with the federal statute. So what happens is that the often the federal definition of cocaine is smaller than the federal definition of cocaine in different states. So for example, if you have a conviction for possession of cocaine in let's say Louisiana, so that statute has, includes other things, not just um, the chemical category of cocaine. So they, they, they say, well, any other residue, anything used to mix there, we're also gonna consider it cocaine. But the federal definition is much narrower. So depending on the jurisdiction, and I really don't want to bore you with a lot of chemistry and different terms and everything, but all you need to know is that depending on your, in your jurisdiction and the way that the state defines um, cocaine, it could be that for immigration purposes, that conviction is not really a conviction for possession of cocaine. Similarly, and in our jurisdiction, marijuana. Marijuana could be no longer marijuana for um, deportation purposes in the state of Texas, because the state of Texas defines marijuana much broader than the federal government. Therefore, it wouldn't match the definition of the Controlled Substance Act, and you wouldn't be deportable under this category. Importantly, and there's an important caveat, all right, that would be if you are facing deportation in court. Now, if you're trying to adjust your status, let's say get a green card affirmatively through your family member, loved one, something like that. Um, you, the burden is upon you to show that you haven't made um, or you don't have a conviction that would make giving you a green card um, not allowed. So pretty much inadmissible. That's the term. So, you know, that was good to know that we can we can make some some of these arguments in immigration court. Additionally, um, you know, it's been all over the news that a federal district court in Texas issue an order saying that the most recent prosecutorial discretion memorandum is not valid, that the government cannot rely on it and, and say that we're just going to um, deport certain categories of people. Unfortunately, the Fifth Circuit did not stop the implementation of that order. However, the message is we should continue filing for prosecutorial discretion. At the end of the day, it's up to the agencies to decide who they want to press or what they want to do with the cases. And while they're limiting the implementation of the memorandum, that doesn't mean that we cannot request prosecutorial discretion. There is no order saying such thing. They're only attacking the memorandum. So my practice is to continue filing for PD, continue reaching um, ICE and, and other government agencies regarding uh, these matters, particularly when you have a strong case or there's strong equities in your favor. And you know, here's another thing, right? So the pandemic introduced, um, or well, finally got the immigration courts to welcome cameras and remote um, 
and, and remote, remote court. So it looks as if remote practice is here to stay. And it virtually all immigration courts throughout the United States have implemented the system. But, you know, with the, while this might be helpful in certain circumstances, in some others, it presents some real challenges. So moving forward, if you're facing a situation where the court would insist in having your hearing um, through WebEx, you need to be well represented and know that there's certain due process issues that come up. So for example, if your credibility is being attacked because the camera went off or the interpreter didn't hear you accurately or something came up and the video was cut off, you now you need to be able to preserve your record. So, you know, now more than ever, good representation is essential in immigration court. Here's another um, update, just going a little bit um, broader and outside of the immigration court. But in the asylum world, we have good um, precedent. We have some good case law showing that persecutorial witnesses are a, a, an acceptable or particular social group. Now, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but in essence, in, in, in the asylum world, you need to show that you fit within one of the five protected categories, and one of these are, are particular social groups. So for a long time, myself included, we have advances. We had advanced groups saying, well, persecutorial witnesses are a particular social group with mixed results. But now we have very good um, precedents showing that persecutorial witnesses are indeed a particular social group. This is great news because we do have many cases where individuals testify against either a gang member, a guerrilla fighter, and they face legitimate threats to their life and to their safety in their home countries because they were witnesses against, against criminals. So finally, we have some good precedents showing that you know, that's a, a, a good particular social group. I mean, there's other challenges. Asylum law is incredibly complex, but at least we know we have that new particular social group and we have good case law on that. Also in the asylum context, um, we have, well, some background here. So in order to qualify for asylum, you must not have committed certain offenses, right? But if you, even if you don't qualify for asylum, and you, you're qualifying for another type of protection known as withholding of removal, you would not be allowed to have it if you commit a quote unquote particularly serious crime. Now, there's a statutory definition that says that if you committed an aggregated felony and you were sentenced to over five years in jail, you know, you're out, automatically out. But that the analysis doesn't stop there. Now, if you're dependent on the case, they can look at the facts of the case and say, well, no, this qualifies as a particularly serious crime because of the, you know, of the facts and what happened in this case. So uh, the government was making the issue that if you were convicted of an aggravated felony, doesn't matter the context, you don't need to analyze the context or what happened or the circumstances or anything like that, which, you know, it's absurd because even if you're it's absurd because the aggravated felony definitions are very broad and they cover conduct in many cases that is not particularly serious. So this is, this is still up in the air. Um, there are strong arguments in favor um, of this interpretation. Um, it looks um, that we're going to get a decision pretty soon, but we're still waiting. So this particularly serious crime is still a hot topic that hasn't been um, decided yet. So just stay tuned regarding this. And then finally, and I wanted to um, close with this, is just the that the how CBP is acting and treating people that have been absent from the United States for a long time based on the pandemic. Now we're reaching the end you know, at the end of the pandemic, ironically, I just got sick from COVID. But, um, you know, we see the numbers, we see that's not as big of an issue as it was a few years ago. So for that reason, the flexibility that um, CBP is offering people is decreasing. However, the a, a, a very good suggestion was that even if you're outside the United States for over a year, or what, how many years, it really is a case specific 
analysis. And airlines are prohibited from denying you um, transportation to the United States, even if you're absent for over a year or two years, or if you have a, an expired green card. Often um, consulates or embassies abroad say, no, you should file another form with us. Don't do that because most of those are being denied All right now. Um, frankly, there weren't any cases where, where people said, yeah, they, they, they approved these matters. So the, be the best case scenario or the best thing you can do now is even if you have a lengthy absence, go um, try your luck, talk to a CBP officer, explain your circumstances. I mean, if you're if you were sick, if you're taking care of someone who's sick or their airlines were shot down, you know, that's a very good case. But let's say, you know, something like that didn't happen or the reason that you were absent was something related to something else. All this flexibility is going away. So if you need to come to the United States because you've been abroad, um, you know, for, for a long time, you should try doing this um, sooner than later. Now, folks, this is um, these are, in my view, the, the, the most important updates or at least the most interesting ones and the, those I apply to most people. If you'd like to know more about this matter, um, you can always follow us in our YouTube channel. If you like this video, hit like, follow, share, um, and we would really appreciate that. We try to empower you through information. It's always a pleasure talking to you about these matters. Again, my name is Jorge Molina. Um, our, you can always reach us at info at jmolina.law. Again, info at jmolina.law. Or you can always call our office at 469-708-5800. Again, we're based in Dallas-Fort Worth, but we have clients all over the world. And if you have any questions about your case or any other matter, we'll be happy to serve you. All right. Thank you for watching.